we are training the next generation to meet the strategic challenges of tomorrow. We are dedicated to understanding in order to act better. Before we turn to the second panel, I would like to uh, remind you that uh, you can always click on the bottom of your screen if you would like to have a translation. This whole conference is simultaneously translated, uh, so that's pretty cool. Um, so this morning we had a great discussion about the U.S. strategic pivot. We talked about uh, how it evolved under President Obama and President Trump. We also talked about how um, major U.S. allies in the Pacific responded to the pivot as well as how European countries dealt with it. Uh, so now we turn to the second panel. Um, Yann Bro is professor au Collège Militaire Royal de Saint-Jean. Il sera le moderateur. Yann Bro is assistant professor at Royal Military College of Saint-Jean. He will be the moderator of the second panel, which will be ending at 2.15 p.m. and will be followed by some closing words uh, from me. Without further ado, here is Yann to present the second panel and the speakers, the panelists. You have the floor, Yann. Thank you very much for inviting me, Jonathan. I'm delighted to be with you all today to talk about uh, the reactions uh, to this uh, pivot uh, under the Obama administration, which was uh, somewhat transformed under the Trump administration with this free and uh, open Indo-Pacific region. So I'm so delighted to be with three high caliber experts, Bonnie Glazer, uh, Zachary Pekin and Pierre Pallavi, who will discuss the positions of China, Iran and Russia respectively and the new strategic equilibrium in the region. I remind you that you can type in questions in the Q&A section, not the chat question at the bottom of the screen. Without further ado, we will open with Bonnie Glazer. Of the China Power Project at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, where she works on issues related to Chinese foreign and security policy. Mrs. Glazer is also a non-resident fellow with the Lowy Institute in Sydney, Australia, and a senior associate with the Pacific Forum. Prior to joining uh, CS IS, she served as a consultant for various U.S. government offices, including the Departments of Defense and State. She has written extensively on Chinese foreign and security policy. She is currently a board member of the U.S. Committee of the Council for Security Cooperation in the Asia Pacific and a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and the International Institute for Strategic Studies. Mrs. Glazer, uh, thank you again for being with us uh, for the next 20 minutes. Our virtual floor is all yours. Well, thank you, Yan, um, and thank you for the invitation to participate in, uh, in this panel and this really interesting discussion on uh, the pivot to Asia. So I'm going to be focusing on Chinese views uh, ranging from uh, when the pivot to Asia was first rolled out in 2011 till today under the Biden administration. Initially, there was debate in China about the drivers of the US pivot to Asia. And whenever there is a potential shift in US policy, uh, the Chinese spend a good deal of time debating US intentions. We saw this in the George W. Bush administration, for example, when then Deputy Secretary of State Bob Zelik gave his responsible stakeholder speech. So the announcement of uh, the pivot prompted a Chinese debate. An early editorial in uh, Xinhua argued that the pivot to Asia was intended to expand US access to foreign markets so as to prop up a failing US economy and to uh, improve Obama's reelection uh, chances. Others, of course, had different views. Uh, there were some leading experts who maintained that the pivot to Asia was aimed at containing China's rise. The latter view uh, stressed, for example, then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton's intervention at the ASEAN Regional Forum in July 2010, 
which signaled that the United States would become more involved in uh, the South China Sea. Over time, um, as I will uh, discuss, the view that the pivot, the rebalance, and eventually the free and open Indo-Pacific Indo strategy um, are all aimed at containing China's rise. So this uh, view has gained currency over time. It is the dominant assessment today. Notably, however, I think that there is continuing debate in China about how China should respond uh, to this strategy by the United States. So when the pivot was first rolled out in 2011, China was in the run up to its leadership uh, transition, which took place in November of, uh, of 2012. And uh, so combined with the fact that China was continuing to debate and assess US intentions and the significance of the pivot, China's reaction was somewhat muted and restrained um, in the final year of uh, Hu Jintao's rule. The first clear indication of China's policy response was October 2013, when uh, there was a periphery diplomacy work conference in China. Um, and that emphasized uh, that ensuring China's vital interests um, on is, its periphery uh, is, a, is a priority. And, and Xi Jinping gave uh, a, a, an important speech at this periphery diplomacy work conference. And, and I see if really three major uh, messages coming out from that conference. The first was that strengthening relationships with all nations on, it, on China's borders uh, was an important priority for Beijing. Secondly, um, uh, Xi Jinping emphasized that China's neighbors should be allowed to benefit more from China's economic growth. The third message um, was really not prominent in the public version of uh, the speech, which of course the entire speech was not made public. It was summarized in Chinese media. But I think the third message was that China should use its leverage to gain deference from China's neighbors and also to deter them from challenging Chinese interests. So I disagree with those who have portrayed the significance of this in periphery uh, diplomacy work conference as primarily or only uh, aimed at reassuring the region. Uh, there was one source who told me at the time um, that Xi Jinping had said uh, in this internal speech that China needs to keep its neighbors off balance and use surprise to China's advantage. And in fact, this is exactly what China put into practice. Uh, in November of 2013, after the holding of this conference, when it announced uh, an air defense identification zone in the East China Sea, and when China deployed its uh, Haiyang Shiyo 981, which is an oil uh, drilling rig in Vietnam's waters in May of 2014. So China was rhetorically reassuring its neighbors but in its actions, it was also warning them not to align closely with the United States and its pivot to Asia and not to challenge Chinese interests. So this was followed by a more proactive effort to dilute US influence in the region. And Xi Jinping gave an important speech at the Conference for Interaction and Confidence Building Measures in Asia in 2014. And I will quote from that speech, he said, Asian people should run the affairs of Asia. Asian people should solve the problems of Asia. Asian peoples should uphold the security of Asia. Asian people have the capability and wisdom to achieve peace and stability in the region through enhanced cooperation. And in that speech, Xi Jinping proposed the creation of a new Asian security architecture, presumably with China at its center. And then China launched uh, the policy of pivoting westward, uh, wherein China sought to diversify its relationships beyond just maritime East Asia by cultivating closer relationships with Russia, with the European Union, and with nations in um, Central Asia, 
this policy was actually the roots of uh, what later evolved into the One Belt, One Road uh, initiative or a Belt and Road initiative. So there are three schools of thought about the US pivot or rebalance to Asia that uh, a Chinese scholar uh, wrote about in 2017. So I wanna briefly outline these schools. I think they're really interesting. The first one uh, says that uh, China's rise to almost superpower status has required the US to undertake this pivot to Asia to preserve its own global position. But that school of thought says that the US really doesn't have the economic or mobilization capability to sustain the pivot and it won't be able to contain China's rise. So the prescription there is uh, China should remain alert or vigilant, but should avoid overreacting. The second school of thought views the pivot as aimed primarily at containing China, but also having the broader goal of responding to the growing importance of Asia globally um, and rebalancing U.S. foreign policy to account for Asia's increasing significance. So the policy of this prescript, uh, policy prescription of this school um, is similar, defend Chinese interests, but also avoid overreacting. China should remain uh, calm, but it should demonstrate resolve um, as well as avoid taking actions that might drive regional countries to join the United States in this pivot or uh, that might evolve into an anti-China coalition. The third view is a little bit more alarmist. This school of thought posits that the U.S. pivot to Asia poses a direct threat to China's economic and security interests, especially because the U.S. has this regional network of alliances. So U.S. involvement in China's disputes with neighbors in particular uh, complicates China's security environment. And the policy prescription is that China should prevent the United States from uh, working with its allies and partners, um, and also to demonstrate resolve to protect its interests. But importantly, this school really ad 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 um, advocates a more activist uh, response. So it's my sense that Chinese policy is based primarily on what I described as the second school's assessment during most of the Obama administration. But concerns about the U.S. pivot began to grow in the last two years of the Obama administration and continue to grow in the Trump administration. And of course, the Trump administration then adopted the Free and Open Indo-Pacific or FOIP to describe U.S. strategy. Beijing ultimately concluded containment is the primary focus of U.S. strategy and China's response should be more proactive. China's concerns about U.S. intentions were intensified uh, under the Trump administration, um, particularly by U.S. freedom of navigation operations in the South China Sea and U.S. efforts to weave together some of its alliances, um, uh, Japan, Australia, Japan, and India comprising uh, the Quad, for example. And China's foreign ministry spokesmen and ambassadors started to adopt a harsher tone, describing US policy as aimed at confronting and containing China, uh, in particular by counting the Belt and Road Initiative and attempting to drive a wedge between China and nations in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, there are signs, I think, that Chinese anxieties um, about U.S. strategy, which continues to be called the free and open Indo-Pacific under Biden. Um, there are signs that these anxieties are further increasing. Uh, the Biden administration's emphasis on reinvigorating U.S. alliances, on utilizing the Quad and strengthening it, have pro provoked uh, greater worries in China. Until recently, Chinese diplomats, I think, were fairly sanguine that the Quad wouldn't develop very far and uh, it would just uh, result in uh, very limited cooperation. Uh, but I think that this attitude is, is, is changing. Um, uh, I, we, I see growing worries in China that, uh, that the Quad may lead to greater regional instability. Um, one Chinese report argued uh, that these four countries 
Um, uh, this was in, originally in 2019 when they were less concerned. One Chinese report argued that the four countries would pursue their individual interests rather than collective gains and thought that the BRI, as long as China was was implementing the BRI well, that they really didn't have uh, much reason to worry. But then after Biden uh, came to power, we hear other expressions of concern. Uh, their foreign ministries institute, for example, there's a uh, the executive vice president there, Ranzonza, recently described Biden as very familiar with the rebalancing policy from the Obama era. And he said, and I quote, that Biden is good at using a variety of mechanisms and tools to contain China's peaceful development with its allies. And then Ranzonza said that Biden hoped to see the Quad uh, to advance a multilateral ap approach to advancing US regional interests and declare that Captain America is back. So Chinese concerns, I think likely drove Beijing um, uh, to push uh, a few things as the transition from uh, Trump to Biden took place. This includes the new investment uh, agreement with Europe, as well as uh, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, or RCEP. Um, and both of these uh, were uh, completed basically and signed, although of course not yet um, uh, all ratified uh, before Biden took office. China may be surprised, I think, that the FOIC label survived the Trump administration and uh, that maybe not that the geographical frame remains the same, but that the, the, the word remains the same since uh, when new administrations come in, they, they often throw out the, uh, the labels used by previous administration. Uh, but uh, it has survived uh, and the Chinese argue um, themselves that this geographical frame of Indo-Pacific is not a sustainable concept for the long term. And despite the fact that Indo-Pacific is being used by more and more countries, Beijing continues to eschew using this term. So when Chinese foreign ministry officials um, have delivered talks at regional meetings, for example, um, that have Indo-Pacific in the title. Uh, for, for example, there was uh, a meeting in Indonesia in 2019 and Chinese officials who spoke at that conference used the phrase in uh, Asia Pacific instead of Indo-Pacific. Um, uh, when Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi was asked uh, to comment on the paper that was released by ASEAN in uh, 20, I believe it was tw mid-2019, that paper was called an outlook on the Indo-Pacific. And this was laying out the strategy uh, of uh, the members of ASEAN. Um, Wang Yi uh, called for countries to first focus on East Asia and Asia, uh, to focus on cooperation and consensus to focus on openness and inclusiveness. Uh, so China has been concerned about being excluded from these Indo-Pacific strategies or as being treated as a target by the US and its partners. So senior Chinese officials such as Wang Yi have warned explicitly against using FORC to target China, saying that doing so would provoke a new Cold War that is out of sync with the times. And Beijing is increasingly publicly blaming the, the uh, FOIP or US pivot for increasing tensions in the region. Recently, China's ambassador to, uh, uh, to the uh, United States, Cui Tian Kai, he was on a, uh, a Sunday morning talk show and, and he talked about US strategy. And he said, um, uh, you know, who is on the offensive? Who is on the defensive? You just have to look at the map. They're all far away from the United States. The fact is, whenever you have more involvement by the United States, you have greater instability anywhere in the world. Look at the Middle East, he said. Look at some other places in Latin America. It's so obvious that when you are rebalancing or pivoting, whatever the word might be, there is more instability in that region. So this is a really tough statement and actually much tougher than we have heard from the Chinese previously. Also quite uncharacteristic, by the way, for China's ambassador Cui, who usually is more moderate. 
So today, China is really, I think, more concerned about the military and diplomatic actions of the U.S. and its strategy than in the economic realm. The withdrawal of the U.S. from the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership in 2017, eased pressure on China. And the Chinese have signed their own free trade agreements with South, South Korea and Australia. Um, now, of course, the investment agreement with Europe and RCEP. And China views its Belt and Road Initiative projects as a source of uh, leverage. So the Trump administration's plan to compete with BRI to provide alternative sources of financing for infrastructure really didn't amount to very much. And now on top of this, China's COVID-19 diplomacy, its PPE, its vaccines that it is giving to countries in the region and around, around the world are also seen as a useful tool uh, in competing with the United States in the region. So China sees advantages in the economic realm. Um, diplomatically, there's a bit of adjustment in China's policies. China has tried to stabilize its relations with Japan, which we know deteriorated sharply beginning in September 2012. This has been very gradual, of course. Um, a Xi Jinping visit to Japan was postponed uh, in part due to COVID-19. Um, China's worked assiduously to woo South Korea and weaken the U.S. ROK uh, alliance. Um, it, it certainly has exploited opportunities uh, that were created by growing friction under the Trump administration between Washington and Seoul. Uh, China's strength and ties with North Korea. Xi Jinping has had five summits with Kim Jong-un between March 2018 and June 2019. Um, China has prioritized improving ties with Southeast Asia. Um, we've seen uh, not, uh, Wang Yi has visited nine out of 10 ASEAN countries just in the last four months uh, alone. So these diplomatic moves are consistent with broader Chinese foreign policy objectives, but they may also be a result of growing Chinese concerns about U.S. FOIP strategy and U.S. efforts to promote the Quad and the Quad Plus. I think I'll close just by saying something about Taiwan. I think the most dangerous aspect from China's perspective about US policy toward the Indo-Pacific really is its policy toward Taiwan. Um, the pivot or rebalance did not reposition Taiwan within the US policy toward the region. Strengthening of uh, defense ties with Taiwan really took place below the radar. There was no major shift in the US one China policy during President Obama's presidency. But under Trump, there were breakthroughs, both in the executive branch and uh, in Congress. Uh, Trump sold new F-16s, uh, precision guided air launch cruise missiles, coastal defense cruise missiles. Um, the Obama administration had not explicitly included Taiwan in its pivot or rebalance strategy, uh, but the Trump administration did. In June 2019, the Defense Department issued a very important paper on the Indo-Pacific that highlighted Taiwan's role and called it a country for the first time ever in a U.S. official document. There were joint U.S.-Taiwan military exercises and other operations that used to be kept under wraps that were made public under Trump. And the U.S. promoted high-level contacts um, with Taiwan. Um, and in its final days, the Trump administration eliminated its restrictions on contacts with U.S. officials. So since Biden has come into office, I think um, there really are no signs that the administration will continue the practice of using Taiwan as a weapon against China. But it has signaled that it will continue um, firmly supporting Taiwan. And in the words of the Biden State Department, um, U.S. support for Taiwan remains rock solid. So going forward, as China observes and assesses U.S. strategy toward the Indo-Pacific region, its greatest concerns will be U.S. policy toward Taiwan and the potential U.S. effort to forge a coalition of countries or several coalitions of countries that could um, hamper or damage Chinese interests going forward. I will stop there and I look forward to hearing my other panelists and engaging in the discussion.
Thank you very much, Bonnie. This is a, a wonderful way to summarize the growing Chinese uh, anxiety, which resounds pretty well to what is actually going on in Russia as well, because pretty much of the feeling you've described is, I think, something that could apply very uh, much to Russia. So we look forward to welcome our next panelists. Uh, Mr. Zachary Paikin, uh, I will present the in French. I will now present in French. He is he holds a PhD from uh, Kent University in Canterbury. He's a researcher in, in EU foreign policy at the Center for European Policy Studies in Brussels. Also a non-resident research fellow at the Institute for Peace and Diplomacy in Toronto, as well as a senior visiting fellow uh, at the Global Policy Institute in London. Uh, he additionally holds expert affiliations with the Minsk Dialogue and, international, and uh, the uh, Canada-Russia Research Initiative based in Victoria. His research is mainly on the relationships between the large powers, uh, a great power rivalry, etc. Uh, he has been published by leading think tanks, including the European Council on Foreign Relations, the Royal United Services Institute, the Russian Insti International Affairs Council, LSE, and so on. It is a great pleasure to have you with us today, Mr. Paikin. You have 20 minutes and you have the floor, sir. Thank you very much, Jan. It's a great pleasure to see you all. Thank you for inviting me to be a part of the panel today. Thank you for Jonathan Paquin, uh, to Jonathan Paquin uh, as a director uh, here. And uh, I'm, I'm delighted to be here as a collaborator. And it's, the relations between the large powers is a topic that will become more and more important and relevant in years to come, quite certainly. So thank you all for being with us today. Uh, the benefit of, of most uh, panelists uh, throughout the conference, uh, I think most people here are Anglophone, so I will uh, deliver my remarks in English if that is all right with everyone. Uh, I'll just begin uh, today uh, with uh, a conceptual discussion, if you will, to provide the adequate context to understand Russian foreign policy. I'll pivot from there, no pun intended, or perhaps pun intended, uh, to uh, various dimensions of understanding Russia's so-called pivot to the East and the various forms that it's taken. And from there, uh, I will discuss uh, some of the uh, implications for Canadian foreign policy and geostrategy that we might be able to, to dwell upon uh, as well. So uh, first of all, three things that I think, there are many things to know obviously about Russian foreign policy. Uh, but three of them that I would particularly uh, point out that are relevant for this discussion. Number one is the importance uh, of great power status uh, in the, uh, Russia's uh, sense of self and, and, and as an important aim of its national foreign policy. And this has been uh, a, a present in Russian foreign policy for centuries. Its roots go all the way back to the beginning effectively of modern history with the fall of Constantinople, uh, which left Russia as the only uh, uh, independent Eastern Orthodox uh, power remaining at that point in time, uh, at which point afterwards you saw uh, Ivan the Terrible, Ivan Grozny, be, become the first uh, to name himself Tsar, uh, Tsar of course being a translation of Caesar, and so obviously there, that led to natural tensions and seeking a, a sort of equality with the Holy Roman Empire at the time. So this desire for, for great power status being recognized uh, and, and for a sense of equality with other European powers goes way back. Uh, it continued throughout, uh, you know, the era since the, the uh, mid 18th uh, century, uh, when uh, when uh, you know Europe was uh, Russia, excuse me, was welcomed as a fully fledged great power within the European balance of power system, and then continued after World War II and into the contemporary era when Russia, then the United uh, the, the USSR, excuse me, uh, was one of the founding members of, of the United Nations and the UN uh, and a permanent member of the UN Security Council, which is in its view the international order that that reigns. Uh, until this day, uh, and it's worth noting that uh, in the context of the post-World War II uh, context, unlike earlier in, in modern history when we saw Europe effectively be the main other against which Russia um, measured itself, uh, the United States after World War II becomes the primary other, and so at that point in time, Russia's great power status, or it's, it's, it's seeking great power status, is a journey that takes place primarily, by and large, after World War II in a global context and at the global level, uh, rather than exclusively at the European one. 
Zachary, Zachary, sorry to interrupt, just to give a chance to our translator to properly translate your excellent presentation. May I ask you to proceed <laughs> a little slowly? <laughs> so, second of all, uh, is the question of norms. And in the Russian worldview, norms matter. And I think that this is something that is not appreciated enough in uh, particularly North American, but Western as well, but particularly North American uh, uh, foreign policy circles. It's not just about questions of raw power calculations in which Russia engages in its foreign policy, but it's about, as I was mentioning before, status and recognition, right? So this goes back to uh, you know, early periods in, in modern history as well, but expressed itself particularly uh, 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 in, a, in a salient fashion uh, following the end of the Napoleonic Wars with Tsar Alexander I, uh, who uh, effectively uh, uh, found himself as um, uh, a proposed for the first time, if you will, at the, at the Congress of Vienna, this notion of a uh, holy alliance and, and therefore some sort of a system that goes beyond a mere balance of power, but also included a set of shared principles uh, with, with the likes of, of other conservative powers, such as Prussia and Austria at the time. And then the norms that are associated with the post-World War II order, uh, you know, having sacrificed 27 million uh, of its own citizens in, in World War II, this is something that, that uh, you know, is very important to, uh, you know, Russian foreign policy is this notion of playing a role, uh, a leading role as a great power, but that's a, that's a question of status and of norms. It's not just a question, therefore, of raw power calculations. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this you know, notion of norms as well, uh, in importance continues into the post-Cold War era uh, in which Russia considers itself to be a defender, a true a, a defender of the true international order, if you will, uh, against you know, perceived uh, elements or, or actions uh, of the United States that are, that are seen as unilateral. And so, uh, Basically, the way to understand Russia, I would think, there are many different facets of Russian foreign policy, uh, obviously, but rather than thinking of Russia as a realist power, I think it's much more useful to think of Russia as a conservative power. That is to say, we're not living in an anarchic system, but rather we're living in a situation where Russia sees itself as a defender of an international order that is replete with normative content. Uh, and this notion of Russian conservatism, Russia as a conservative power at the international level, uh, it, it reveals the extent to which it sees the West as the primary term setter, right? So if the West is sort of this leader of the liberal international order and Russia sees itself as a conservative power, this leads me to the third thing to know about Russian foreign policy, which is its West centrism, its responsiveness to the West and focus on the West, right? So first of all, uh, there is uh, this notion that's brought up by Vyacheslav Morozov, uh, who is a professor at the University of Tartu in Estonia, this idea that Russia has, has had a subaltern mentality, uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the West. Uh, and this has been true, not just in terms of, of, of normative discursive realities, but also in terms uh, of material realities, right? When uh, we saw a major shift uh, towards, uh, you know, the, uh, at the beginning of the age of exploration, which coincides more or less with the beginning of modern history, you see the major trading lanes of the world that head out onto the high seas that move towards the high seas from the traditional uh, more uh, land and river-based routes. At that point in time, uh, Russia becomes sort of a, a subservient uh, economy, if you will, to the capitalist European core uh, of the global order ever since then, right? And so this, this material and normative and discursive dependence on the West, which is obviously a controversial proposition because you know, some critics of this idea will say that it deprives Russia of genuine agency, but nonetheless, you could even say that, you could say that there's nonetheless uh, you know, a West centrism, even if it is not an element of, of dependence. But nonetheless, this, this has found itself expressed as well in the post-Cold War era, right? So we've seen multiple times Russian foreign policy cite Western foreign policy doctrines and Western foreign policy actions as justification for its own foreign policy actions, right? So we saw this uh, uh, numerous different times in the post-Cold War era, quite prominently with uh, the, the Bush administration's global war on terror uh, and the Bush doctrine, the notion of, of the legitimacy of, of uh, you know, unilateral action in the national interest. Uh, and this was uh, you know, what, what Christopher Coker at the London School of Economics likes to call US exemptionalism rather than US exceptionalism. Uh, and so uh, basically the idea was that you know, if the United States and others are allowed to act unilaterally in order to secure their own interests against terrorism uh, uh, and, and the like, um, uh, then of course uh, the Russia should similarly 
you know, have the right to, to act, for example, against Chechen insurgents in a similar way, you know, which is a proposition uh, that, uh, that you know, the West did not necessarily agree with, right? So that's one instance. The second instance is with the unilateral recognition uh, of Kosovo uh, by many, but not all Western countries, uh, which was, you know, basically cited as, as a pretext or as a precedent for Russia recognizing first, you know, in the context of, of the Russo-Georgian War in 2008, uh, the independence of Abkhazia and South Ossetia, uh, and then more recently in 2014, the legitimacy of Crimea's transfer as well to, to the Russian Federation. Uh, and so the point here is that the same goes for the pivot, right? Same goes for the United States pivot to Asia is that the announced pivot to the East uh, that, that Russia undertook beginning in the early 2010s was to a certain extent mirroring the United States pivot to Asia and in response to the United States pivot to Asia, right? So the pivot to the East that Russia has laid out brings all three of those fundamental pillars of Russian foreign policy together, right? It emphasizes bicontinentalism, the idea that Russia is not exclusively dependent on Europe or on the West, but also an Asian power and bicontinentalism is an expression of Russian great power status and Russia's unique status or place in the world as this bicontinental power by virtue of its geography. Uh, it also uh, expresses the extent that it is a conservative power resisting Europe's uh, you know, sort of liberal impositions by saying, look, we have an alternative. We're not entirely reliant upon the liberal West. Uh, and then finally, of course, there is this irony that it is nonetheless in response to the West, right? It is in response to this pivot to Asia that the United States has undertaken. So you have this dualism of Russian foreign policy here, in which it, it simultaneously expresses its difference from the West, but it is nonetheless in response to the West. So there is this cyclical, if you will, subaltern dynamic that may be expressing itself there as well. The Russians will of course claim that their pivot to the East is exclusively in order to pivot to you know, a more dynamic in economic terms, Asian region, and that it's a natural change in the global balance of power. Uh, but this doesn't take away from the fact that there was a reactiveness to this move uh, as well. So. Uh, moving on to the three different dimensions of Russian uh, of Russia's pivot to the east, if you will, and the three different ways in which it's expressed itself. Uh, first, we saw just the announcement, if you will, of the pivot to the east. It was unclear precisely when this begins because uh, there are some sort of um, uh, informal announcements of this in the early 2010s, going back to 2010 itself. But it becomes much more salient, much more prominent in formal in formal documents and in announcements coming into 2011, particularly 2012. Uh, in the context of uh, the Russian presidential election that saw Vladimir Putin return uh, to the Kremlin. Uh, and so uh, nonetheless, this is basically a, a rhetorical pivot that does not accelerate in any significant sense for these first few years. Um, it's uh, primarily uh, put forward, not just because of this American announcement of the pivot, but also due to Russia's frustrations, in particular in its relations with the West, which had accumulated over the course of the previous two post-Cold War decades, for example, Dmitry Medvedev, who served as, as president of Russia from 2008 to 2012, uh, had his attempts at putting forward or proposing a new European security treaty in which Russia would be a, you know, an, an equal member, if you will, of, of a new European security architecture that would be inclusive and that had not yet been uh, you know, agreed upon after the end of the Cold War. Those efforts were rebuffed. Uh, and then of course, in 2011, uh, in the autumn of 2011, there was uh, the, uh, the intervention uh, of, uh, or rather in, uh, across 2011, there was the intervention uh, of, uh, of uh, NATO uh, in Libya, which uh, NATO saw as, you know, Western powers primarily saw for the most part as having a humanitarian mission uh, and which was approved by the UN Security Council, but which Russia and, and even other certain Western countries did not see as legitimating regime change in Libya. And this is part of what drove uh, Putin actually to calculate that he should uh, you know, return uh, to the Kremlin, uh, basically end this liberal experiment of Dmitry Medvedev uh, and, and adopt a sterner posture towards the West. So these frustrations help to emphasize, if you will, this pivot uh, to the East. Um, this is followed after the 2012 uh, uh, election uh, in Russia, presidential election, with uh, the uh, uh, emphasis in Putin's uh, new term, his second sort of uh, uh, come, uh, come around in the Kremlin, the emphasis is placed on this uh, newly launched Eurasian Economic Union, which is not formally signed until later, until 2014, 2015. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, the negotiations and deliberations over, over this begin, and this is considered effectively to be the signature project of, of Putin's turn in the, uh, term in the Kremlin uh, from uh, 2012 uh, until 2018. Uh, and so originally, the Eurasian Economic Union is actually pointed towards the West. It's pointed towards Ukraine in particular, and it's meant to offer Ukraine uh, an alternative 
uh, to the European Union's Association Agreement and DCFTA, Deep and Comprehensive Free Trade Agreement, uh, that was put forward. So even though it was, you know, Eurasian nominally speaking, nonetheless, it showed the extent to which Russia's focus remained, even at this point in time, towards uh, towards uh, the West. Uh, however, uh, you know, given the events in, in Ukraine in 2013, 2014, uh, and the crisis, uh, you know, uh, that has that has been uh, situated there ever since. Uh, and then the, the territorial integrity of the country that's been compromised and the sanctions that have been imposed by the West upon Russia. At that point in time, uh, Russia realized that it had little option, but actually to emphasize more the eastward vector of its foreign policy and the Eurasian Economic Union at this point in time, then genuinely takes on a more Eurasian orientation, uh, if you will. Uh, nonetheless, there are some challenges to this as well. It was unclear uh, in 2014 precisely what shape the Eurasian Economic Union uh, would take. Uh, however, with time, it's become relatively clear that it's little more than a bona fide uh, customs union, even though it is nominally based upon the, the four freedoms that the European Union has and model on the European Union institutions. Uh, it has not been able to develop the level of, of, of integration along the lines of the European single market. Uh, and so as a result, this has been to a certain extent a challenge as well of Russia's pivot to the East, the extent to which it's actually been successfully able to emphasize the Eurasian and Asian vector of its foreign policy rather than the European uh, and, and uh, Euro-Atlantic one, uh, if you will. Uh, beyond this, actually, Russia has traditionally dealt in, in, in uh, quite often with many of its post-Soviet neighbors in a bilateral context. And so the creation uh, of the Eurasian Economic Union in a multilateral context, if you will, if one could argue that this represents a weakening uh, of Russia's influence in its own so-called uh, near abroad and reveals actually the extent to which some of the smaller countries uh, in the Eurasian Economic Union, there are only five members at this point, uh, are able to exercise influence over Russia's foreign policy, seeing as the extent to which Russia trades with its fellow members of the Eurasian Economic Union uh, is actually quite limited uh, compared to its other trading partners. Whereas uh, the smaller countries in the Eurasian Economic Union, whether it's Belarus, Armenia, uh, uh, Kazakhstan or Kyrgyzstan, uh, are more interested in getting access to the Russian market and then finding ways to have some sort of a bulwark, if you will, or an alternative to excessive dependence on China, even as China obviously will remain, particularly in the case of the Central Asian countries, a, a major motor of, of the modernization and the development of those countries. So there's a little bit of a parallel there actually with this free and open Indo-Pacific concept that's put forward first by Japan and developed primarily by Japan before it's sort of embraced by the United States. You see a similar thing here where the Eurasian Economic Union is to a certain extent more of a Kazakh initiative in many ways than it is a Russian one. Uh, and beyond this, uh, moving, uh, moving beyond these two first vectors of Russia's pivot to the east, first the, the, the announcement of the pivot, and then you know the development uh, but fronted of, of uh, the Eurasian Economic Union is this new vision put forward a couple of years uh, after uh, the, the beginning of the, the crisis uh, in Ukraine, uh, most prominently by Sergei Karaganov in the pages of Russia and Global Affairs, which is basically the Russian uh, equivalent of foreign affairs, uh, in which uh, he puts forward this notion of the greater Eurasian partnership or a vision of a greater Eurasia. Uh, and the idea there, again, is that the primary vision after the end uh, of the Cold War for European security and for the European economy is some sort of pan-European greater Europe from Lisbon to Vladivostok. And the Ukraine crisis in 2014 marks the definitive failure of this project. And so Russia regroups and it puts forward this notion of a greater Eurasian partnership. Uh, at this point in time and basically says it's going to be rooted in pluralist political principles uh, mm -hmm. and Europe can only you know partake in it uh, you know if it accepts the pluralist uh, political pr uh, the, uh, pr principles upon which uh, it is based. Uh, May I invite you Zachary at this point to come up with your concluding remarks since we're a little short of time. Well, yeah, I didn't realize we're so short on time okay so <laughs> my, my apologies so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll just skip ahead uh, here to what, what, it, what this basically shows at this point in time is that uh, the, the Great Eurasian Partnership is to a certain extent a dependence uh, upon China, right? It reveals the extent uh, to which uh, Russia has, uh, you know, little option without Ukraine, as, uh, you know, Zbigniew Brzezinski has often said that without Ukraine, Russia is not a general great power, not a major empire. And so it becomes effectively more dependent on China and needs to bring China into this new uh, sort of equilibrium and this new project of, of Greater Eurasia, right? So that sort of weakens the extent to which we can actually say, uh, that that you know this pivot is actually substantive across Asia because the extent to which we've seen you know a, a Japanese or Korean investment to avoid excessive dependence on China uh, you know has has obviously been limited 
uh, the extent to which it's that Russia has been able to develop other uh, you know, vectors uh, of its of its Asian uh, policy has also been limited. I mean, its partnerships with India and Vietnam are long lasting and long standing, but that is not necessarily, they're simply used instrumentally, if you will, to avoid excessive dependence on China. Not that excessive dependence on China will lead to a definitive junior partner status per se, but it just shows the weakness overall uh, of this overall pivot to the East that we've seen uh, from Russia. And so it shows that Russia right now finds itself in an interim state effectively right now. That Thank sounds you. like a very nice concluding point, uh, Zachary. Yeah, thank you very, thank you very much for uh, this broad overview. Uh, I would love, love to jump in with some, some comment, but I will keep it for the Q&A period uh, because we've got a third panelist, uh, last but not least, uh, my colleague, Pierre Pellavi, qui est professeur titulaire au Collège Royal des Forces Canadiennes de Toronto. He's a professor at the Royal Canadian Forces College and director of international security. Pierre has written many papers on strategic communication and various articles on regional strategies and international strategies for Iran. And this is why we've invited him today. He's published um, many books on the Iranian revolution, and he works as a media consultant on Iran, among other things, and he's the holder of the Ronald Dandurand Chair. Pierre, thank you for being with us. We have 15 minutes to hear you on the way in which Iran is being positioned in the positioning in the area. Thank you. Thank you to the network. Thank you to Jonathan Paquin for the invitation and for organizing this despite COVID or not. Space, uh, but I will try my best to, to, to stay within those 15 minutes that are uh, uh, alluded to me. Uh, Iran, uh, en parler? En parler uh, Why talk say... about Iran? Why talk about it today? You may have seen that uh, as of today, Iran was in the papers, including because of the American strikes in Syria. Not a day or a week goes by without uh, them making the front page of the paper. And I think it's a well way, a good way to round up uh, this panel. So the Asian pivot, this repositioning towards Asia for the Middle East is based on a, a bet. It's a, a gradual disengagement from the Middle East to recenter on the eastern part of the continent. And this also involves promoting a Middle East system that has more stakeholders than in the past. And of course, this goes hand in hand with another bet that may be more ambitious, which is to reintegrate Iran in the Middle East uh, group. And without the reintegration, there is no stability possible. So I've just been said since this morning, the basis of this refocus for the Middle Eastern policy for the U.S. are visible. As soon as Obama takes office, you can read between the lines as well. In the uh, speech made in Cairo called New Beginning in 2009, when Obama asked, to, asked Washington and the Arabian states to redefine their relationship, and he also opens the door to an interaction with what he calls himself moderate, moderate Islamists. And this is also part of a policy that's uh, begun at the time. It's the open hand to the Islamic state of Iran, which began in, in 2009. March 2009, and within this policy, Obama asked us to open a new chapter in the Iranian-American partnership and to begin a partnership 
with Ali Khomeini. From the beginning, from the outset, this ambition, this bet to restructure Iran-U.S. relationships is um, a problem, including the election of Amadi Dejan, which was challenged, uh, his intransigence, and is being discovered by Iowa of a secret nuclear station in 2009. In 2010, Iranians discover a program that was implemented by the U.S. and Israel to neutralize Iran's nuclear program. In 2010, the Iran refuses the, the negotiations for medical isotopes or expanding negotiations. And by 2010, 2011, we feel like we've come to ahead when many sanctions that are imposed on Iran. Par un phénomène géopolitique d'une importance considérable, c'est le printemps arabe de 2011, dont on fête aussi les 10 ans. Il s'accompagne d'un certain nombre de développements intéressants pour l'Iran, je dirais même davantage. Il fournit des avantages intéressants pour l'Iran. Now, this provides interesting benefits to Iran amongst the disappearance of a few Arab leaders. Osni Mubarak in Egypt. Mubarak in Egypt. D'autres dirigeants, d'autres régimes mieux disposés à l'égard de la République islamique. Comme par exemple, is someone uh, that they would be happy to see gone and uh, rather have uh, Mohamed Morsi Egypt. It was one of the first initiatives undertaken by Iran to allow uh, naval ships to 1979. sail through the Suez channel. And so this will have a, an interesting this will have an interesting impact on Iran. It will weaken in Arabia Saudi a repli de l'Arabie Saoudite, uh, including the bunkerization Saudi Arabia, and it neutralizes some of its adversaries, including Israel. Du pivot asiatique en 2011 par le président Obama. Donc l'annonce que les États-Unis vont se dissoudre. So Obama then announces that. The U.S. will disengage from the Middle East to focus on the eastern part of the continent. And all of this is great news to Iran, who sees it as a, a good thing. And the president, Ahmed Ahmadinejad, proselytizes at the time and promotes a new Middle East, a Middle East that's more beneficial to Iran. Since the Americans uh, were thereafter more interested in the Far East. And therefore, starting in 2011, the Iranians will take advantage of that disengagement to develop a, a policy, a very broad policy that will lead them outside um, their sphere of influence, their um, Iranian Shi Shiite uh, sphere of influence, uh, will lead them to be active throughout the Middle East, in, in, in the Levant, in uh, Yemen, in North Africa, in Saudi Arabia, in Sudan, in, in the Horn of Africa, and in the Sahel, and uh, far afield in Sub-Saharan Africa, in Latin America. So starting then, it, it, short of being omnipotent, Iran has become omnipresent and is again at the center of the Middle Eastern chessboard. However, um, academics have uh, been starting to underline the negative effect of the Pacific pivot in the Middle East. In fact, uh, especially Tehran's strengthening and is pursuing destabilizing policies led by the Al-Quds force, the, the Revolutionary Guards in the region, but uh, uh, that, that includes the uh, nuclear program. 
But nonetheless, the Iranians will keep uh, seizing the momentum created by the uh, Pacific Pivot and the Arab Spring, and uh, will also uh, ride the coattails of a number of other uh, events. Uh, the um, election of Alatoya Sandrani at the uh, the pre uh, presidency in, in Iran, who is more reassuring than Ahmadinejad, and they will also um, uh, take advantage of their fight against Daesh, against the Islamic State, uh, um, alongside the international coalition led by the United States. So de facto, the ex former country of the axis of evil, uh, evil and the great Satan uh, became uh, fellow uh, fellows in the fight against uh, uh, the common enemy, the Islamic State. And the Iranians will seize that opportunity to um restore their uh, reputation uh, to 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 uh, restore their image internationally uh, to present themselves as being uh, acceptable partners uh, especially compared to, to to the crazies of daesh of islamic state and they therefore feel that they are in a strong position to negotiate on thorny issues especially the nuclear uh, issue in 2013, therefore, Iranians were all the more uh, ready to make concessions on the nuclear file that they they saw uh, an opportunity to re-legitimize uh, their regime internally in the eyes of Iranians by uh, giving a, a breath of fresh air to the Iranian economy by 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 uh, lifting sanctions because the economy was had been extremely had been deeply affected by the international embargo and warm their relations with the united states and and the western governments so uh, come back to the uh, the front uh, the, the the front of the stage of the international stage uh, the uh, signature in july 2015 of what was called the uh, jcpoa or joint common plan of action that uh, places Iran on the threshold of being reintegrated into the international community and seems to um, start uh, a process, an inexorable process of normalization of Iran's relationship with the world so that Iran would uh, become a central country in the, in the, in the Middle East. Uh, and at that time, observers didn't hesitate to call Iran the true superpower of the Middle East, um, or the term Pax Iranica was even coined to uh, to, to to describe the situation um, that had, was playing out to the Iran's advantage. But this corollary of um, the United States uh, disengagement in the Middle East w was going to um, was going to um, uh, be be countered by a, a major obstacle: the zero-sum game logic in the Middle East. What is that uh, logic? Which is that any benefit to Iran will be automatically interpreted by Israel and by Saudi Arabia as being a failure and a loss for them, as being a, 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 a dead loss in terms of their own interests. In other words, Israel and Saudi Arabia will see warming, uh, warming, warming relationship between Tehran and Washington as a challenge to their own privileged relationship with the West and with the United States in particular. And what are they going to do? Well, from the outset, right after the signing of the uh, 2015 nuclear accord, they did everything to reverse the effects of the Pacific pivot and re-engage the United States in the Middle East uh, uh, by, by uh, sending out a, a, a distress call that uh, it, it is uh, it perceived by Donald Trump uh, and uh, that the we know what comes next the adoption of the Trump doctrine for for um, the the Middle East a, a, a remarkable um, uh, rapprochement between Israel and Saudi Arabia and the the implementation of a maximum pressure strategy a 360 degree um, uh, uh, economic starvation and a military pressure strategy on Iran to uh, put the Iran, Iranian genie back in the bottle and, and confine Iran to its traditional sphere. Over the past 10 years, I would say that uh, the restructuring uh, created by America's disengagement in the Middle East and its recentering on Asia has had a number of side effects. Um, 
the, the, the main one being a polarization of the regional um, power relationships, which is often wrongly uh, being presented as a, a, a Shiite-Sunni um, division, which does, or well, that does exist. It's uh, uh, an opposition between, on the one hand, Iran, Syria, and to an extent, um, Iraq and the non-state partners such as Hezbollah. Um, and all that under the benevolent, distant, and prudent patronage of Vladimir Putin's Russia. And on the other hand, Israel and the uh, petromonarchies, the oil monarchies of the Gulf led by uh, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, uh, Bahrain, and all that under the benevolent, distant, and relatively prudent patronage of the United States under Donald Trump, but also um, the United States under Joe Biden until we have evidence of the country, because so far I haven't seen any major co uh, changes coming in, in those alignments. Generally speaking, the uh, Asian pivot uh, had um, uh, uh, effects uh, at, at the scale of the continent. By disengaging from the Middle East, the United States sent a geopolitical message, a geopolitical void message, uh, the, and that void was immediately filled by Russia and China. Uh, at the same time that the United States are pivoting to Asia, the Russians and the Chinese are pivoting to the Middle East. Since 2011, Russia has uh, has been has come back in force in the Middle East with, it, with the help of its Iranian partner, which is used as a platform to project influence. And what Zachary was talking about, the uh, restoration of Russia's geopolitical grandeur. And China, China is penetrating the Middle East, as when he was saying earlier, by, by uh, the, uh, the Chinese strategists very quickly, very commonly describe Iran as a country that's at the center of everything and as one of the key links in the so-called New Silk Road, which is uh, uh, conceived as a way for China to negotiate strategic partnership with Iran right now. So everything is happening as though the, uh, the strategic pivot had contributed to uh, uh, ushering in the advent of a Eurasian bloc articulated on China, Russia, and also all the countries that gravitate around uh, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, including Iran. I would conclude by saying that 10 years after uh, it, 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 its introduction, the concept of uh, um, Pacific pivot has been easier to conceptualize in theory than to implement in practice by the Americans. The United States have learned at their expense that, as has always been the case, Iran is a, 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 a country that uh, that cannot be ignored, n no more so than the United States can afford to neglect the Middle East. Why not? Because that would involve huge risks. Number one, uh, yield a huge margin of maneuver to Iran to pursue a number of destabilizing policies, or at least policies that are counter to the United States and their partners' strategic interests in the region, and especially the major risk of creating a geopolitical void at, at the same time that they're laying siege to China. China and Russia uh, are expanding their footprint in the Middle East. And I will conclude with that. Thank you very much, Pierre, for this uh, extremely enlightening uh, tour of the situation uh, related to Iran. So uh, we have a few questions in the in the uh, uh, question and answer, but first I will uh, take advantage of my status as chair to ask the first question. There is a, a, a consensus about the multipolarization of the international system, which uh, at the intellectual level does bring uh, Iran, China and Russia to, to, a, to convergence. You mentioned the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. From uh, Russia's point of view, it's a major organization. We've seen more and more larger and larger military deployments between Russia and China over the, the past few years. But the Iranian piece intrigues me. Iran is knocking at the door of the Shanghai Organization for the past several few years. It's an observer since 2005. But at, the, at this time, there's no question of it being admitted as a member. Uh, Bonnie, on this, what, how China views uh, strategic collaboration with Iran? 
Uh, Pierre mentioned there are huge investments in Iran that are being done right now, but how do you that this this is one dimension of the Chinese foreign policy I haven't uh, heard about uh, yet. Could you could you describe and and to Zakari, uh, how would you see Russia's resistance of having Iran on board within the Shanghai Cooperation Organization? Bonnie, if you may start. Yeah, I'm 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 sorry, I missed part of uh, the question. Could you repeat what what you would like me to address? The question was how China relate with the idea of having Iran joining the Shanghai uh, Cooperation Organization, and how would you assess the state of the Chinese-Iranian uh, relation? Well, I, I'm, I'm sure that some of our other speakers are, are more well-informed on this issue than I am. My, uh, my, my, my focus is not so much uh, on the Middle East. But chi China has an important relationship with the Middle East, uh, with Iran in particular, it, 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 uh, uh, in the area of oil imports. Um, Iran features very, very heavily uh, in, in China's uh, uh, bilateral relationship with Iran. Um, I have not closely followed uh, its position on, on Iran in joining the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. So I'll defer to others. <laughs> Zakari, you have something to add on this? Yes, and apologies again for going on for too long. I'm just very passionate about the subject and I can assure you it doesn't happen very often. Uh, but the, the, uh, the answer to the question is that Russia is generally in favor of anything that makes the international order appear more multipolar. So Russia in general is the, the force that has been driving the expansion of, this, of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. They were a driving power behind uh, India and Pakistan, uh, both joining uh, as full members back in 2017. So there's a parallel there perhaps with both Greece and NATO being member, Greece and Turkey being members of NATO. They've managed to bring both Pakistan and India into the SCO. And that shows something very interesting, I think, about the nature of the eastward vector of Russian foreign policy, which is, mm -hmm. although the westward vector towards Europe is much more confrontational, at least as of late, Russia has the ability to play the role, I would say, of being a helpful fixer in the Eurasian context far more. And we've seen this, for example, in the context of, of the recent uh, China-India uh, clashes, you know, uh, in the, earlier in 2020 in Ladakh. Uh, in which Russia played an important role as an interlocutor between the two sides and ensuring that that escalation uh, did not get too out of control. And so I wonder if this is something that Canada can think about as well as the global balance of power shifts towards the East. Can we maintain our more militarized NATO-based foreign policy when we are engaged in the Euro-Atlantic sphere and possibly look uh, towards the Asia Pacific and Eurasian dimension of our foreign policy, perhaps more as a helpful fixer and talking more about the economic and diplomatic dimensions and trying to, to ensure that the, the current US-China clash, which is becoming increasingly zero sum, does not erode the rules-based international order and open trading system on which Canada relies so much. And if that is the case, if we can compartmentalize those two facets of our foreign policy, then perhaps there is actually room for strategic dialogue between Canada and Russia, if not in the Euro-Atlantic sphere, then at least in the Asia-Pacific sphere. So it would be interesting if we can think strategically in those terms in Canada, which so far we've been unable to do. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, talking about cooperation between uh, US and its uh, allies, we've got a question from uh, Jan Weinberg. Uh, it's a question for Bonnie. Uh, to which extent do you think NATO cooperation with the US military in the Indo-Pacific region exacerbate the hostility with, 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 uh, with, China, with China? And that would directly uh, point in the direction of what, how Canada should, 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 should uh, get involved. Well, you know, NATO's involvement um, in the Indo-Pacific um, has been fairly limited, uh, although there has been greater attention, I think, paid to, to China in recent years. Um, and uh, uh, of course, as uh, some of your speakers earlier this morning, who talked about France and the UK in particular, uh, contributing to um, uh, some of the military deployments, exercises, freedom of navigation operations in the, in the South China Sea. Yeah, I, I, I think that these will, will continue. But NATO's focus, um, I think, uh, obviously remains um, appropriately on Europe. Uh, there are issues pertaining uh, to, uh, of, cost, uh, of course, costs, um, um, operational focus and, and efficiency uh, that I think really require Europe to be more focused, uh, NATO to be more focused on Europe um, and to some extent on North Africa. 
So I expect uh, that um, if we look at how the United States might um, raise this in, the con in, in this context with NATO, there might be some interest in having NATO members uh, take on a greater load, uh, greater responsibility for the for defense burden in, um, in Europe, maybe freeing up uh, some of US resources then to focus more on the Western Pacific. Uh, but I doubt that there will be a, uh, a, a significant NATO role um, in, uh, in the Indo-Pacific. That's, that's just my sense. Yeah. There's another question related coming from Samantha uh, Duchesne uh, regarding the situation with, uh, with Myanmar democracy. So you mentioned how it was important for China to, uh, to, to find Asian solution to Asian problem. Uh, any chance that um, attempt by the West to uh, pressure the situation in, in, the, in, in Myanmar might, might contribute to the degradation of the situation? And how do you see the, the Myanmar uh, crisis right now influencing the, the situation? Well, the, the Myanmar crisis uh, is... Um... Uh, really poses uh, challenges, I think, not just for those who want to see democracy continue to thrive in Myanmar, but also for, uh, for China, uh, because China had actually very good ties with the National um, uh, League of Democracies the, uh, the, uh, and uh, Aung San, San Suu Kyi's party, uh, and actually uh, has had some, a complicated history with uh, the military from Myanmar in the past. So we've seen some very interesting statements come out of uh, China where they are uh, in, in actually flagging concerns about instability and in encouraging um, uh, those in, 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 in power now in the military uh, to uh, calm down the situation and not use, uh, use violence. So regardless of who rules in Myanmar, China wants to have good relations with that government. So it's really walking a very fine line. It doesn't want to alienate um, uh, the, uh, any, any of the uh, members of Aung San Suu Kyi's government or the military junta. So um, I, th I think you know, this, is, um, this is going to play, it at, play out over the course of the coming weeks and, and, and months. And, and China is going to want to position itself to be able to preserve good relations with Myanmar, regardless of, uh, of what happens. Of course, for countries like the United States and Canada and other democracies, um, we need to try to hold the military's feet to the fire to um, return the situation to the, um, uh, the rule of Aung San Suu Kyi and her party, which um, has won uh, a huge victory in the last elections um, and we need to ensure that democracy is returned uh, to Myanmar and that the, the, uh, the, the, the people's uh, rights uh, are, are protected. Uh, so I think it, we're, we're at a very, I think, uh, interesting juncture in Myanmar. I hope the situation turns to the better in the coming weeks and months. Thank you very much. Uh, another question from Jesse uh, Benoit, who is coming again on the topic of China's influence uh, in the Middle East. Uh, and the question is, does this presence is becoming a threat for the Russian interests at short and middle terms? How Russian elites generally react about that strategy? Do you see that there is a, a convergence of, of, of view uh, between Iran and, 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 and Russia uh, on this? Or is there a ground for uh, further disagreement? Uh, Pierre and Zachary, may you react on? But Okay. On that issue, there is room for creating a, a, a fault line between uh, Beijing, um, Moscow, and Tehran. The Iranian elites um, see the growing influence of China and Iran with a very jaundiced eye. When it was uh, learned in the summer of 2020 that the Iranian regime and Beijing were negotiating a very broad strategic partnership that included security elements, but also economic elements. There was a, 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 a public backlash in Iranian opinion, a kind of a nationalist fever. Uh, Iranians denounced the purchase of the Isle of Tish in the Persian, Persian Gulf. 
there was also uh, a backlash against uh, the, uh, well, this is Iranian par par paranoia, but it, we have to take it as it is. Iranians felt that the COVID pandemic ha had been developed in the, in the city of Qom, in, in the center uh, of Iran, because of the presence of uh, many Chinese investors and diplomats. So there is a, a, a possible backlash, strong backlash, and Iranians are always very opposed to anything that looks like imperialism. They, they opposed imper Western imperialism, yes, but if they see that, if there's something that looks like a Chinese form of imperialism, that's why, um, just to go back to your first question, we have to, uh, that's why they, they want to keep their the relationship with the Shanghai Cooperation Organization as informal as possible. The Russian elite has already priced in China's rise into its foreign policy strategy a long time ago. Uh, and as I mentioned during my presentation, Russia remains West-centric in the sense that its primary security concerns come from the NATO alliance. So its primary consideration anywhere across the rest of the Eurasian landmass uh, by and large, that doesn't mean that it doesn't take nuanced positions on certain issues, such as, for example, when it comes to, to Vietnam and then its claims in the South China Sea. But by and large, the, the, the most important thing for Russia is to ensure that the West is boxed out, right? So whether that's the Russian-Turkish condominium in the South Caucasus that we saw after the recent Nagorno karabakh conflict, uh, or whether, you know, it's China's rising presence in places like the Middle East or in Central Asia, the more important thing is that this is coming at the expense of the West for Russia. Uh, which shows the extent to which Russia is actually capable of engaging in positive sum foreign policies with other uh, uh, powers when interests align. And it shows the extent to which Russia can, in this context of the Eurasian uh, uh, sphere, if you will, serve to a certain extent as a helpful fixer. If you ask, you know, Indians and Pakistanis, for example, I'll say the last thing on this, you know, what do you think about Americans? Obviously, you know, it's a very divisive issue. What do you think about the Chinese? Very divisive issue. But Russia, everyone seems to agree that, you know, Russia is, is okay there. So, you know, by and large, this is something that I think Canada should actually be encouraging, is a, is a greater, more active Russian presence in its eastward foreign policy sector. Zachary, Pierre, Bonny, merci infiniment. J'aurais souhaité... Zachary, que... Pierre, uh, I would have liked us to be able to continue that exchange. Um, but I'm receiving uh, the cook very clearly. So thank you for your presence and your participation today. It's an honor and uh, a pleasure to have listened to you. So Jonathan Paquin will uh, wrap up. Jonathan. Thank you, Yann, and thank you to all the members of this final panel on the reactions of rival powers to American rebalancing. So a number of things uh, were, have been said about the pivot, and I would like quickly, in conclusion, to underline certain points that uh, uh, appear to me to be fairly important. The first point is that the American strategy in the Indo-Pacific is not the work of a single administration, the Obama administration. It was initiated uh, in the early 2000s under the Bush administration, and that is what um, Rachel Adele uh, uh, recalled. So that the overarching American strategy in the Pacific is, an, is a work in progress. And as Pierre Pallavi was saying just now, it seems that the American, from the American viewpoint, uh, it was a lot easier to conceptualize the pivot than to implement it over the past 10 years. Second point, it seems that there is still a kind of ambiguity about the American rebalancing. On the one hand, in, uh, the US political elites, uh, in, among the, these elites, some have hinted that the rebalancing was entirely related to the rise of China, was focused on China, whereas others have suggested that this strategy was not related to China, but that it was more focused on business opportunities in the Pacific and to the fact that international trade is more and more concentrated in that region. So clearly there are, are strategic tensions in Washington within the political elite in terms of the rationale for this rebalancing. Bonnie uh, Glazer also showed that uh, this ambiguity um, exists in Beijing as well in terms of the response, uh, the appropriate response to the rebalancing. There are several schools of thought um, uh, each uh, proposing a different response to the uh, overarching American strategy. In terms of allies, as uh, Cleo Pascal and Natalie Sambi uh, pointed out, there's a lot of ambiguity. Many allies 
would like to have an open approach to China, an open hand for commercial reasons, essentially. But at the same time, they tend to support the American rebalancing because they fear China militarily. So many United States allies, most, the vast majority of US allies have adopted a kind of a hedging strategy uh, towards China. In other words, they've adopted, uh, they've taken an, uh, a set of measures in order to avoid clear strategic choices. They've taken actions that uh, uh, first glance seem contradict to be contradictory. For example, they're engaging China commercially while um, putting forward positions that, that are um, th that focus on on containment towards China. And the fourth and last point is that a number of speakers have pointed out that by adopting an overly aggressive strategy towards China, we run the risk of uh, creating a self-fulfilling prophecy. That is to say, the harder we push China, the more China is likely to react strongly with a corresponding rise of tensions. Therefore, it seems that uh, a great deal of uh, diplomacy and delicacy is required in order to avoid making the situation worse and dealing with a lot of ambiguity and a lot of instability related to this transformation in the nature of the system. And this is why this theme of the strategic pivot is so interesting and fascinating. We are, are, are working in the midst of uncertainty. We are trying to look to the future and in the current context, it's very hard to do that. So this concludes our symposium. I hope that uh, you. Um, I, I hope that you uh, uh, have enjoyed the the talk. I would like to thank my um, partner Bruno Blais, who has helped me in preparing the symposium, as well as Anaïs Elamraoui, Catherine Poulbourg, and Brian Woodman, who helped us with the um, with, to help us publicize the event. And I would ask you to stay on the lookout for Strategic Analysis Network events. Each week we're. We publish strategic papers, political papers, video capsules uh, on current issues, uh, in not counting the many uh, symposia that we organize regularly. So uh, keep your eyes open, and I wish you an excellent day. Thank you.